Father, I ask that, Holy Spirit, you would come and help us to really get what's being said, what's being taught tonight. I pray, Lord, that I will not just be a preacher of the word, but I'd be a doer of this word. And I pray for everyone here that they would not settle for being hearers of the word, but do a work in our hearts tonight that will make us doers of it. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen and amen. Well, in July, we're doing a series called Significant Ser Sermons of the Decade. Uh, significant Sermons of the Decade. Uh, somebody said to me, so there's four of them. Somebody said to me this week, you could find that many. Um, but I think we found four of them uh, to share with you. And the first one is the subject, Hallowed Be Thy Name. Hallowed Be Thy Name. And you'll notice in the bottom corner that it was originally preached on Wednesday, January 15th, 2003. And I point that out just for a little bit of history here. There was a time in Lawson's uh, spiritual journey when we had church on Sunday morning and Wednesday evenings. And uh, this sermon was originally preached on uh, January 15th, 2003. There's a fact that all of us need to face, and it's simply this. Prayer is a primary means of maintaining an intimate relationship with God. Prayer is a primary means of maintaining an intimate relationship with God. Marriage uh, is a good analogy often in these things. Don and I will begin round 38 on uh, Wednesday, celebrate our 37th anniversary on Tuesday. And uh, marriages really begin to suffer if all you ever do in your marriage is public. You're always with people. You're always going to have a crowd around you, and that's the, the only way your marriage expresses itself. This is good. This is wonderful. I love this. I spend a good part of my week praying for this and getting ready for this. But if if this is all we if this is all we have, if if this uh, getting together in public settings is all we have, I suspect you have not discovered the depth of intimacy God wants to have with you. Prayer is a primary means of maintaining an intimate relationship with God. And so the disciples who followed Jesus around kind of watched him and noticed how he lived. And, and they noticed he had a habit, he had a pattern of getting up early in the morning and he would go uh, to a certain place and he'd pray. And uh, this is what we read about the disciples' response to that in Luke chapter 11. It happened that while Jesus was praying in a certain place, after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. Just as John taught his disciples. They saw him praying. They said, this must be important, so we better learn how to do it. He said, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John also taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. 
He teaches them a lot more, but that's where I want to stop tonight. He said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Hallowed. Interesting word. Means uh, to sanctify, to set apart, to revere, to praise, and adore, to make and keep holy. <laughs> the point is really simple. When you're going to pray, don't rush into the give me mode. Give me, give, give, God, I need this, and, and I need that, and my daughter needs this, and give me. When you pray, don't rush into the give me mode, but make sure you are honoring, holding God's name as hallowed. You're revering it. You're praising him. You're adoring him. Now, nine and a half years ago when I preached that, we didn't do texting on Saturday night, but if you've got a question that comes up during this message, we'll take a few minutes to answer anything that comes up until we run out of time. Um, hallowed, how do you pray? When you pray, say, hallowed be your name. Interestingly, there's a contrast in Scripture to this. And when Moses went up on the mountain, God gave him a bunch of rules about how we're to live. We have shortened it and know it is the Ten Commandments. One of the Ten Commandments says this, Exodus chapter 20 and verse 7, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. For the Lord your God will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. Now, the worst word I said when I was growing up was shoot. And uh, when my mom heard me say shoot, she corrected me very quickly and said, John, don't take the name of the Lord your God in vain. So I stopped saying shoot. I'm older now and mature now and recognize that uh, there was probably a little misappropriation of scripture there. Here is what it means to take the Lord's name in, in vain. Vain means to rush over, to regard as useless, regarded as having no real value to say there's nothing to it. I think there should be a very clear picture forming in your mind. When you are praying, you have two choices. You can take the name of the Lord your God in vain and say, uh, this isn't an important part of the prayer. I'll just rush into this and get to the give me stuff. Or you can start your praying as God instructed us to start our praying. And that is to hold the name of God as hallowed. So the question the Holy Spirit would ask us tonight is how have we been praying? Have we been praying taking the na Lord's name in vain? Just rushing over it thinking that's inconsequential and immaterial? Or have we been holding his name as as hallowed, 
honoring his name, revering his name. See, you have two choices in prayer. And, and the first way you can pray, try to get into God's presence, the first door you can try to work on is you can try to enter God's presence taking the name of the Lord in vain. Or you can do what Jesus taught us to do. And he taught us to enter God's presence every time regarding the name of the Lord as hallowed. Disciples said, teach us how to pray. And he said, when you pray, say, hallowed be your name. So the question that, that comes up is, okay, so if I'm supposed to hold God's name as hallowed, uh, what is God's name? And Moses had the same question in the book of Exodus when God was calling him to lead the nation of Israel. He said, I can't just show up and say, hey, I'm Moses. I'm your new leader. Uh, I, I have to go in your authority. But when I tell them you've sent me, they're going to say, oh, yeah, what's, what's your name? So this is what we read about in Exodus chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. Moses said to God, Behold, I'm going to the sons of Israel, and I will say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now, they may say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. So what's God's name? God says, My name is I am who I am. <laughs> you get to the New Testament, Jesus gets in trouble because he begins to describe himself that way. He says, I am the way. I am the bread of life. I am who I am. God says, when people ask you my name, say, his name is I am. I am who I am. Very important to know his name. Remember the first time I saw Donna, I was sitting in church about where Cam is from the front, and Donna was up in the choir and I got brave, and I said, after church, I'm going to find out her name. If I hadn't bothered to find out her name, we wouldn't be celebrating 37 years on Tuesday. A fundamental plus start, pl starting place in, in relationship building is you find out an individual's name. What's the Lord's name? He says, I am who I am. Now, I am in the Hebrew is the word Jehovah. So if you were translating I am, uh, or if, you, if the word wasn't translated, it would be Jehovah. So God's name, I am, is Jehovah. And we get some revelations in Scripture, progressive revelations in Scripture of, of God's name. And one of the really beautiful ones is in Jeremiah 23, verses 5 and 6. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch. This is prophesying about Jesus. And he will reign as king and act wisely and do justice and righteousness in the land. In his days Judah will be saved, Israel will dwell securely. And this is his 
name by which he will be called the Lord our righteousness. So what's his name? I am who I am. Now in the Hebrew, if that was Hebrew we were reading now, that yellow part would read Jehovah Sidkenu. I am who I am. I am the Lord who is your righteousness. I am your righteousness. For me, this is a starting point in almost all of my praying. When I get alone with Father, and I just want to commune with Father, I just want to talk to Father. I often begin by worshiping and adoring God's name as revealed as Jehovah said, can you? I adore the fact that Jesus is my righteousness. And as we looked at in Jude verse 24 last weekend, the Lord presents us to God blameless. We get in God's presence and God, Jesus says to the Father, hey, here's my brother, here's my sister, and he is blameless. Why is he blameless? Why are you blameless? Why am I blameless? Because of what the Lord has done for you. What the Lord has done for us. He is our righteousness. And I adore that name and I revere that name and I worship that name. And it's so important for us when we're praying to stop and do that. Because if we don't do that, the enemy is going to come. And he's going to say, remember when you drank too much? Remember when you snorted this? Remember when you smoked that? Remember when you lied in that job interview? And he's going to haunt us on that stuff. And what you do when you're praying is you say, none of that matters because the Lord has made me righteous in your sight. You honor his name. You revere his name. You adore his name. You worship him. How do you enter God's presence every time? You adore him. You hold his name as Hallowed. Another example of getting to know God's name revealed to us in uh, Exodus chapter 17 and, and verse 15. The Moses built an altar altar is a place where you meet God and he named that altar the Lord is my banner <laughs> in the Hebrew that yellow would read Jehovah Nisi it's his name I am who I am I am your banner in battle any of you here tonight, don't raise a hand, just think about this. Any of you here tonight going through a struggle? Going through some battles? Going through some hard times? One of the problems we see happening in, among Christians over and over again is we take his name in vain. And when we're going through struggles, we start to fight those struggles in our own strength. And whenever we fight them in our own strength, we usually end up creating a big, huge mess. In the battles and struggles of your life, you need to hold the Lord's name as hallowed and you need to say, I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that you are my banner in the battle. 
You're the one who's going to fly the flag. You're the one who's going to do the fighting for me. You're going to stand up for your child. My paternal grandfather passed away in 1979, 78, I think it was. He, uh, came to Canada in 1925 or 26 from Russia, determined to get out of that land that was just being taken over by the communists. He, he wanted to make sure he was able to raise his kids in a country where God could be worshipped. He said, I'm getting out of here. He began to make the plans. Big undertaking for a husband to take his wife and his two tiny kids across the ocean to settle in a place where the only reason to go there was to make sure that his kids would be raised to worship Jesus. And he began to save his money because he had four boat tickets to pay for. And he saved and he saved and he saved those Russian rubles and when he had finally enough to pay for the, the four boat tickets, he found a, a wooden shoe box. Some of you are too young tonight to understand this story, but you've probably seen it in a movie somewhere. He went and he lifted a part of the kitchen floor up, and he went down in the cellar, and he took his wooden box of rubles with him, and he took his shovel with him. And he dug a hole in the dirt in the cellar. And he hid the wooden box in the dirt. And then he covered that wooden box with dirt and went upstairs and had it hidden and felt safe. Well, Grandpa kept it there for a couple of months, but it was two nights before he was supposed to leave. And he went down into the cellar and he loosened the dirt and pulled up his box and put it on the middle of the kitchen table and counted the rubles. It was all still there. He and, he and his wife could make their way with their two kids to, to Canada. And later that evening, there was this terrible knocking and ruckus at the door. And Grandpa looked and the KGB were at his door, 13 Russian policemen. And they said, Emil, let us in. And Emil had no choice but to open the door. And they said, Emil, some of your neighbors have told us you're, you're going, to, going to Canada. And Emil just looked at them. He said, are you going to Canada? And Emil went. Emil, your neighbor said you're going to Canada. And they began to turn that house upside down, looking for the boat tickets or the money. And he was this far from the money. And he began to pray, Lord, blind their eyes. Lord, blind their eyes. Lord, please blind their eyes. And the story, my grandfather told me this story. The story is those Russian 13 of them, KGB agents, spent an hour and a half turning that house upside down. And they finally said, Emil, you must be staying. We find nothing. And the house was turned upside down. And the rubles were this far from my grandfather. Sometimes we fight battles we should never, ever be fighting. And when we do it, we're taking the Lord's name in vain and not realizing that he is the one who fights the battles of his kids. And so, how, how do we pray? When we pray, 
We don't rush into God's presence. We don't rush into God's presence. But we take time to hold his name as hallowed. It's so important we, we get this, friends. A couple of scriptures you need to, you need to be aware of. Psalm 9 and, and verse number 10. Those who know your name will put their trust in you. For you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek. Those who know your name <laughs> will put their trust in you. Something happens when you get to know God's name. Your trust in Him rises and rises and rises. Your spiritual confidence increases and increases and increases. Those who know His name put their trust in Him. <laughs> the enemy will come and he'll say, Remember when? <laughs> You don't need to let it get you down for two seconds. Put your trust in him. Know his name. His name is Jehovah said, can you? I am your righteousness in my sight. You are blameless. Hallelujah. Those who know his name. But there... Trust in him. Read this great verse. Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 10. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and is safe. Hmm. Sometimes, sometimes life gets tough. Sometimes life gets tough. You need to be acquainted with his name. Because when life gets tough, his name will be a strong tower for you. And you'll be able to run there and find a place of safety. Two ways to pray. Two ways to pray. You can try to enter God's presence. Take in the name of the Lord. God in vain. If you do that, here's what I promise you. The result of it will be faithless, ineffective prayer. If your foundation is not in a revelation of who God is. He is who he is. I am who I am. If your prayer life is not rooted in a foundational revelation of who God is, you'll be praying faithless, ineffective prayers. <laughs> and my gut instinct is you'll get tired of praying real quick. I mean, why wouldn't you? Or you can enter God's presence every time regarding the name of the Lord as hallowed. And when you learn to do that, when you learn to do that, here's the result. Believing effective prayer that accomplishes much. Lord, Blind their eyes. <laughs> Lord, blind their eyes. Believing effective prayer that accomplishes much. Now I'm going to see if any questions have come in. And Don is going to come and help me answer them. Come on, sit up here, Don, and 
we'll dialogue for a few minutes before we uh, we dismiss. I've chosen Dawn tonight because uh, Dawn is the elder of our church, uh, and the position of elder is really a position of uh, spiritual leadership and care. We got deacons, and deacons look after the practical stuff, but churches are supposed to have an old guy who looks after the spiritual things. So we found this guy, and Don, you look a little older than you did when you started with me 10 years ago. I know I'm looking younger all the time, but um, here's, here's the question that's come in. I don't know if this is the only one. If you got one, send one in. I'll figure out how to find out if there are more. But can we trust in God without knowing his name? Can we trust in God without knowing his name? Do uh, you want to start tackling that? It's an interesting question. Um, well, to be put on the spot and just off the top of my head... I think you run into difficulty, as some folks do, who don't know the name of the Lord. They're praying in vain, as pastors talked about. But their idea and their conception of God is one that is um, without biblical foundation. If they don't know him, they fabricate their own God, and uh, they run amok. I guess my short answer to that very good question would be, uh, yeah, you can trust God without knowing his name, but uh, it's probably at about a, uh, a grade one or two level when God really wants you to move, on, move into kind of a, a university level relationship with him. Um, this is pretty foundational. Um, to getting to a point of real trust and confidence in God. Getting to know who he has revealed himself, who he has revealed himself as being through scripture. Uh, when you know that, you can trust him. If you don't know it, it's really hard to trust him. So, uh, anything else coming in here? If not, we move on. So here's your, here's your quick chance to, to contribute. Looks like you're getting off easy, Don. Um, so here's what I want us to do. You can stay up here. I like Kevin company. Uh, and then you get on YouTube. Okay? Yeah. Uh, everybody's going to be flocking there this week. <laughs> New record viewing. Um, so here's how, here's how I want us to end tonight. I want you to... I'm going to... And there's not time to deal with all of them, but I'm going to now, on the screen, give you eight revealed names of God. And I want you to find somewhere to scribble them. And I, I want you this week to, to begin to just get to know his name. And begin to, begin to pray these things and, and put confidence in them in him because this is how he's chosen to reveal himself and uh, feel free to even take a picture of it on your camera if that's the easiest way for you to do this but on your phone he's revealed as Jehovah Rohi I am your shepherd get to know that name I am your Shepherd, the Lord wants to lead you. Jehovah Shema, I am there. You never need to feel lonely. God is always there with you. I'm always there. Thank him that he walks through life with you. Sometimes I think we lose track. Don and I are spending, trying to spend two or three days every week at Living Waters Camp um, trying to get my feeling for what happens at all of our camps so I can lead and serve in that area of ministry better. But 
also it's a great place to make a fire in the morning and not feel like you have to get to the office. So I'm winning in both worlds. But I woke up Wednesday morning, our dog went nuts early in the morning, maybe six Wednesday morning, and I, BB, you're getting on my nerves. That was the only thing I thought. But I got up and I made a, a uh, no, I stayed in the trailer because it was windy and it was cold. And I got out of the trailer about 8.30 and walked around the side of our trailer. And a tree that was this close to our trailer had, had fallen. And that's what B.B. was barking about, the noise of the tree hitting the ground. Here's the amazing part of that story to me. That was where I'd been parking my truck all week. But some, for some reason on Tuesday I thought, eh, I think I'll just go park it over there. I don't have a clue why I decided to do that. Donnie even said, why are you parking the truck over there? And I really didn't have an answer. But God knew what was going to happen Wednesday morning. I am there. He's there for us, friends. Jehovah said, can you? I am your righteousness. Get that one deep into your spirit. Everybody say this, the Lord is my righteousness. The Lord is my righteousness. Again, the Lord is my righteousness. Jehovah Makadesh, I am your sanctifier. Some people like the fact he's our righteousness. They don't like the fact that he's our sanctifier. Give the Lord permission to sanctify you. Honor him. Say, Lord, change me, improve me, cleanse me, pull the guck out of me. I honor you as my sanctifier. I am your peace. God wants to bless you with the peace of God which passes all understanding. No matter what storms and turbulence and circumstances come into your life, you can be grounded in a peace that passes understanding. He is our peace. Jehovah Rafina, I am your healer. Jehovah Nisi, I am your banner in battle. Jehovah Jireh, I am your provider. <laughs> How am I going to pay next month's bills? Well, I wouldn't worry about it because he is who he said he is, and he is your provider. Get to know his name. Honor his name. Trust his name. And so here's the closing exercise, leaving that on the screen. Before you leave, now, and the service is dismissed once you've finished, why don't you take a moment and just zero in on one of those eight, maybe the one that's most pertinent in your life right now, and just honor that name, just revere that name, just worship him. Thank him that he's going to look after the circumstance and the situation you're in. Whatever that worship looks like to you, just, this is just you and him. Honor him, and uh, once you've zeroed in on one of those in a significant act of thankfulness, uh, you can regard this service as dismissed. If you're here for the first time tonight, I'll meet you at the Connection Center or somebody will be there. Uh, we've got a book to give you, uh, Tommy Tenney's book, How to Pray with Passion and Power. How to Pray with Passion and Power. Take a moment and uh, worship. And if you're a first-time guest, glad you're with us. Meet me at the Connection Center. We have a book for you tonight.